Welcome to Electron Online. Now let's take a look at some of the facts and figures regarding the Earth. Something about the size, the weight, where it's at, and so forth. So let's take a look. The average distance between the Sun and the Earth is typically known to be about 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. However, those are average distances. Actually, the distance between the Earth and the Sun changes throughout the year. The average distance in kilometers is 149,600,000, about 93 million miles, but sometimes it is farther away at aphelion. Aphelion is the indication that the planet, in this case the Earth, is farther from the Sun in its orbit. It can be as far as 152,100,000 kilometers away, which is about 94.5 million miles. Notice that's 1.5 million miles more than its average distance, or a difference of about 1.7%. Uh, and as its closest approach to the Sun, at perihelion, the minimum distance, about 0.983 astronomical units. Notice that an astronomical unit is known as the distance, the average distance, between the Sun and the Earth. At that point, it's 147.1 million kilometers away. Notice there's actually quite a difference between the maximum and minimum difference, uh, minimum distance between the Earth and the Sun. And so then it's about 91.5 million miles, so about 1.7% closer from its average value. So the percent difference between the maximum and minimum distance from the Sun to the Earth is 3.4%, 4, 3 which is quite significant, which means when it's closer, it receives, three, it receives quite a bit more energy from the Sun than when it's farther away. And we'll show you some videos on how to calculate that. Next, let's talk about the eccentricity of the orbit. Well, the eccentricity is a singular number that indicates how elliptical the orbit is. Most planets were assumed to have circular orbits once upon a time by the ancient astronomers, but since Kepler we've realized that's not the case. Planets travel in elliptical orbits and the, the eccentricity is an indication of how elliptical that orbit is. But in other words, 0.017 is really 1.7%, meaning that the distance between the average and the highest or lowest value, the maximum minimum distance, is 1.7%, which we saw before. Another interesting concept is that the planets, of course, traveling around the Sun have a certain orbital speed. In this case, the Earth orbital speed, the average is almost 30 kilometers per second, 29.79 kilometers per second, which is also interesting because that's quite fast, 30 kilometers per second, that's almost 20 miles per second. And so as uh, objects cross the Earth's path, and let's say that they cross within 100,000 kilometers, well, at 30 kilometers per second, it doesn't take a long time to travel 100,000 kilometers, so we typically miss those objects by just a few minutes or maybe just a, you know, a few hours or a few minutes. Orbital period is the time that it takes for the Earth to make one trip around the Sun. Notice it's 365.256 days. 0.256 is about a quarter of a day, which means that every four years we need to add one day to the calendar to kind of stay pace with the orbital period of the Earth. But it's not quite 0.25, it's 0.256. That extra little bit of time that it takes for the Earth to go around the Sun means that every one to two centuries, we need to add one more day to the calendar to compensate for that. Otherwise, over the thousands of years, our calendar would be quite off by quite a bit. There's another reason why you also need to change the calendar on a once per century basis. And so they combine those two. And the reason they do that is to make sure that the seasons stay in tune with the calendar as well. Otherwise, if they didn't do anything like that, then over the thousands of years, uh, July would become winter in the northern hemisphere. And of course, they want to avoid that. Next, let's take a look at the length of the day. Now, we always know that the day lasts 24 hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. Well, that's called the solar day. That's relative, relative to the sun, the Earth, uh, the, the average solar day is 24 hours. Now the side real day is the time that it actually takes the Earth to make one rotation on its axis. And so 23 hours and 56 minutes is the what we call side real day that is in reference to the stars. And so therefore there's a f about a four minute difference between the side real day and the solar day. The reason for that is, as in here I have a, a globe with me, as the Earth rotates on its axis, after 23 minutes and 56 seconds, uh, after 23 hours and 56 minutes, the Earth has made one complete rotation, but during that very same period of time, the Earth moves in its orbit around the Sun, and so 
after 24 hours, if the sun is directly in front of me like this, now the earth moves to one degree in one day, roughly speaking, then the earth has to turn for another four minutes to be aligned to the sun again. And that's why there's a four minute difference between the sidereal day and the solar day. The inclination of the earth. Now it turns out, and let me get my globe again, the plane about which the earth revolves around the sun is called the ecliptic plane and the actual tilt between the vertical to the plane and the axis of the earth is about 23 and a half degrees. Currently it's 23 degrees, uh, point, 23.45 degrees, so just about 23 and a half degrees. But over time that will change. Sometimes the angle is a little bit more. It can go as much as about 24 and a half degrees and as little as 21 and a half degrees. So currently the actual tilt, the inclination of the earth's axis is 23 and a half degrees. The diameter of the earth is 12,756 kilometers, but that depends upon which uh, portion of the earth you want to measure. It turns out that the earth is a little bit wider on the equator than it is tall from pole to pole. There's a little bit of a difference there, but the average diameter of the earth is 12,756 12, kilometers. Therefore, the radius is half of that. In miles, we usually say it's about 8,000 miles. Actually, it's slightly less than 8,000 miles in diameter. The mass of the earth, we can say 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. If you want to be a little bit more accurate, we write it as 5.976 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And that's obviously a lot of kilograms. The density of the Earth is quite interesting. Notice the density is 5,515 kilograms per cubic meter compared to the density of water, which is 1,000 kilograms per, per cubic meter, and the density of rock, which is roughly 3,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Since the Earth is much more dense than the density of water and the density of rock, you know that there must also be quite a bit of metal in the Earth. Since the density of metal, the most common metal, iron, is almost 8,000 uh, 8, kilograms per cubic meter, you can see that when you average things out, that means, based on the density, that, that the Earth must be about half rock and half metal. The escape speed, meaning the speed that it takes to get away from the Earth, for example, if you want to fire off a rocket to the Earth, as we commonly do these days, to get completely away from the Earth, not to get into an orbit around the Earth, but to get completely away from the Earth, like the spacecraft that flew all the way to Pluto, you have to have a minimum speed of 11.2 kilometers per second, which is about seven miles per second, in order to escape the gravitational attraction of the Earth. If you don't travel that speed, eventually that spacecraft will slow down, come to a stop, and fall back to the Earth. So to get away, the escape, escape speed, you must travel at least 11.2 kilometers per second. If you just want to get into an orbit around the Earth, into a low orbit, uh, orbit the orbital speed of the spacecraft needs to be about 8 kilometers per second, which is about 5 miles per second. The albedo of the Earth is an indication of how much of the sunlight the Earth receives from the sun gets reflected back into space. An albedo of 0.31% is not a high albedo, but it's also not a low albedo. Some objects they have a much lower albedo, meaning a much a smaller percentage of the light gets reflected. In some cases, some of the icy moons that have a lot of ice and uh, frozen water on the surface, the albedo can be a lot higher, and so the Earth is kind of an average planet in that respect. The oblateness is an indication of how round the Earth is. If it's perfectly round, this would be zero, but it's not perfectly round. It turns out, because of the, uh, the, sp the rotational motion of the Earth, the centripetal forces cause the Earth to bulge a little bit more on the side, and so therefore it is wider for, uh, along the equator than it is from pole to pole, so there's a slight difference. Notice it's about 0.34% difference in the diameter of the Earth from pole to pole versus from equator to equator. The temperature range, which is really interesting for the Earth, the temperature range is actually quite large on the Earth. There's places like the Dead Valley in California where we've measured temperature to be 134 degrees Fahrenheit. And then down below in the Antarctic, we have measured temperatures at minus 128 degrees Fahrenheit, which is of course a huge range in the temperature. That's about 250 degrees Fahrenheit in centigrade degrees from plus 57 down to minus 89 degrees centigrade. However, the average temperature is about 14 degrees centigrade, 57 degrees Fahrenheit. This, of course, daytime, nighttime, summer, winter, all around the globe, the average temperature. But it turns out that the vast majority of the Earth's surface stays actually rather close to this temperature. 
probably within 10 to 20 degrees most of the time. And so you can see that the Earth's temperature on average is, is just perfect for a human life, for most life on the Earth. And so therefore it's an interesting planet in that respect. And finally, the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure at 14.7 pounds per square inch, or about 101,300 pascals, that's newtons per square meter. The consistency of the atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen, about 21% oxygen. So nitrogen and oxygen together form about 99% of the total atmosphere. There's also about 1% argon and a small amount of carbon dioxide, although that's increasing slowly over time, but it's currently at 0.04%. And then water vapor will displace some of these other gases depending upon where in the earth you are if you're over the humid tropics then the water vapor content of the air is much more than one percent when you go to the dry deserts of the earth the water vapor content is less than one percent but on average it's roughly one percent of the total composition of the atmosphere uh, around the earth so now you have some pretty good ideas about the basic statistics of the earth and of course we can then com uh, compare that to the other planets so we start visiting the other planets start studying the other planets so it's a good idea to have a basic understanding about the various uh, statistics and general information about the earth